to uh, welcome you to this uh, very interesting seminar on AC uh, on, on acromioclavicular dislocations. And we have very, very eminent faculty today from India. Uh, I think we are we uh, we know Dr. Ashish Babulkar from Pune. We know him from many years and we have a lot of respect for you, sir. We are very, very happy to have you here. Welcome to our ASON webinar. And when things uh, open up, we must book time with you, sir. We must see you live in person also. I think all of us agree to that. And uh, uh, we would love to hear you speak today. All of us are looking forward. And uh, Dr. Vivek Pandey from Manipal, India. Uh, we have already met him before on our webinars. Uh, so we are very eminent faculty and from the warmth of our homes and this very cold day in Kathmandu, we're going to enjoy a lot of uh, discussion on AC joint. So without any delay, I would like to hand over the moderation to Dr. Amit Joshi, uh, our eminent uh, arthroscopic uh, surgeon from Kathmandu. So I think Amit, you can continue and uh, let's proceed with the program. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rajib. Uh, 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 let me stop this at first and then. Amit Bhai, good evening. Namaste, sir. Yeah, you're you're right on time, Vivek. Yep. Okay. Good evening, Dr. Vivek. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Absolutely. I'm fine, sir. I'm fine. Good to have you here with us again. Yes. Okay. Uh, am I am I audible? Uh, and my slides visible? You are no, audible, sir. No, slides are slides not, not visible. visible. Slides not visible. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rajiv. And then let me start a brief introduction part but your uh, slides are not visible uh, sir. I, for, you cannot uh, see us okay let me do it once again then uh, yes it's it's visible now okay. <laughs> Uh, so, without any delay, uh, uh, I must uh, thank uh, the President Arthroscopy Society of Nepal, uh, the Secretary Arthroscopy Society of Nepal, and the Scientific Committee Chairman uh, to allow uh, this discussion on uh, AC joint. And then we'll be having a very young guns of Nepal, Dr. Vivek Basukala and Dr. Sushil Thapa. Uh, Dr. Vivek uh, is from Kathmandu and the Sushil Thapa is from uh, Chitwan. Uh, uh, and I am uh, Dr. Amit Joshi, who will be moderating practically this uh, this session. So before going to the uh, talks, let me uh, introduce uh, two guests of uh, honors of today. Uh, uh, Dr. Vivek Pandey first is very close friend of mine. And then I always uh, love him, you know, to meet and talk to him because he's the main engine. He's the main igniter of arthroscopy services in Nepal. In 2013, if Vivek remembers, still remembers, that was the first time he visited Nepal. Uh, we had in Army Hospital a conference, and that was the kick point from where uh, you know the Arthroscopy Society of Nepal took a flight. And in 2015, we established our society. And all these, you know, uh, encouragement from Vivek Pandey uh, all the time was uh, very much helpful to all of us. Uh, he's from KMC, Manipal, India. He's associate professor. He doesn't re need any introduction, I think, for Nepalese or audience because he's been part of our webinar multiple times and many a times. Today, I'd like to take a privilege of, uh, you know, introducing uh, Dr. Asis Babulkar. Uh, uh, probably he doesn't require any introduction to those people who have interest in shoulder arthroscopy and many... Uh, uh, almost 90% of um, arthroscopy surgeon who are registered in Arthroscopy Society of Nepal will be present today. And Asis Babulkar sir doesn't require any uh, introduction as far as his, uh, you know, clinical skills, his, his surgical skills, and his, you know, approach to 
various shoulder problem is concerned but a different part of asis babulkar sir is a is a vivid you know um, <clears throat> different he has different approach to his life he's a scuba driver he's a cyclist he's so many thing you know and then, then skiing that is what i was talking to asis babulkar sir in nepal nepal is very very famous for exotic sports you know the zip liners and so types of which you will love probably the highest bungee jump is again in nepal you know probably you would love to come and then um, i would like to you know on behalf of arthroscopy society of nepal on behalf of arthroscopy fraternity i'd like to thank asis babulkar sir uh, for accepting the invitation to be with us uh, today uh, to discuss about um, arthroscopy ac joint basically the ac joint injuries today so today we'll be talking from the basics of ac joint to right up to the advances and the reset advances on the ac joint so without any further delay uh, thanking all the national and the international faculties and thanking all the overwhelming participation of this thing uh, i would like to request uh, dr vivek basukala to start his presentation uh dr vivek you can start uh, sharing your screen and presentation okay sir thank you so much this is not vivek from ams this is vivek from nepal <clears throat> that is the bengali touch of the b y b i b k thank you thank you sir uh respected seniors from arthroscopy society of nepal um very good evening to you all um, and on behalf of arthroscopy society of nepal i would like to welcome and thank uh, ashish babulkar sir and vivek pandey sir uh, to come and teach us in this cold chilly <coughs> chilly evening so i am dr vivek basukala i work in akb center for arthroscopy sports injuries and regenerative medicine and i'm going to talk today about anatomy and biomechanics of ac joint so shoulder joint proper is a very unique joint it is the joint in the body with most range of motion it has almost about 180 degrees of shoulder abduction what it seems that whole of these 180 degree of shoulder abduction is being occurred within the glenohumeral joint which is most commonly we know as the shoulder joint but what actually is happening is in this 180 degree of shoulder abduction there is almost only about 120 degree of abduction in glenohumeral joint and rest 60 degree occurs because of synchronous movement of scapulothoracic joint and this synchronous motion of scapulothoracic joint along with the glenohumeral movement glenohumeral abduction is brought about by interplay of various joint around the shoulder joint these are the acromioclavicular joint and sternoclavicular joint along with the sternothoracic joint so as we all know shoulder joint is a complex joint it does not only include the uh, the glenohumeral joint instead it includes the shoulder glenohumeral joint acromioclavicular joint sternoth uh, sternoclavicular joint and the um, scapulothoracic joint so <clears throat> what happens is this is the animation which shows various part of the shoulder joint complex shoulder joint the glenohumeral joint is formed with the scapula and the humeral head and what happens is this acromion process is attached to the uh, clavicle and this clavicle is then attached to the manubrium sternae and this form the shoulder joint complex this scapula has the um, the very important process which is called bony prominence which is called coracoid process and from this coracoid process are attached few ligaments which forms the suspensory system to this uh, whole of the scapula and whole of the low upper limb <clears throat> and also this clavicle and the acromion is attached with various ligaments of acromioclavicular joint ligament so these are the various complex structures uh, which occurs within the shoulder joint complex and this is another ligament that is coracoacromial ligament which is not so much important for the suspensory com uh, component but it helps in uh, prevention of the superior migration of the glenoid uh, the humeral head 
So what actually happens in AC joint, what actually is there in AC joint is within the AC joint, the, the AC joint is formed by the lateral end of the clavicle and medial end, end of the acromion. In this AC joint, it is covered by the, this is the uh, diarthrodial or synovial variety of the joint. And it is covered by the, uh, the capsule and capsule is further strengthened by the AC ligaments, the superior, inferior, posterior, uh, anterior, posterior and superior inferiorly, the superior and posterior one being the strongest. Inside this joint is the synovial lining and there is unique thing within this joint which is called disc. The disc may be, uh, this may be complete or partial and the function of this disc is not so much common and not, <clears throat> not known perfectly. And <clears throat> by the age of 40 years, most of this disc degenerate. So if the old age patient comes with the AC joint injury while in treatment, the disc are usually removed. To know how these ligaments work, this is the cadaveric video in which cadaveric dissection video in which the both of the CC ligament, AC ligament has been severed. And as we can see, uh, the, super, the vertical and horizontal instability is there. And if the CC component is repaired or reconstructed with some form of threads like this, what happens is there, this is, if the CC ligaments, the conoid portion of this part is repaired, what happens, the whole of the vertical instability is gone, but still there is AC gap and horizontal instability and which, which is gone if the, the repair of the AC joint is done with some form of sutures. So uh, the, from this video, from this cadaveric video, what we can get, get is the CC ligament or the CC ligament is uh, the main vertical stabilizer of the AC joint complex and the AC ligaments is the main horizontal stabilizer of the AC joint complex. <clears throat> There are various types of AC joint, most common being the type A type and most, co most least common being the type D type. And this AC ligament, this CC ligament along with the scapula and the upper limb is being compared with the suspensory, suspensory complex of shoulder. And these are usually compared with the aeroplane in which the body of the aeroplane is cantilevered, the, the two wings of the aeroplane is cantilevered to the body of the aeroplane. And from these two wings, the two jet engines are suspended. Similarly, the whole of the, the body of aeroplane is uh, compared with the axial skeletal and skeleton and the wings are compared with the clavicle. And through these clavicles, through these wings, uh, via the coracoclavicular ligament, whole of the engines, that is the whole of the scapula and whole of the uh, upper limb is being suspended. So coracoclavicular ligament is very, very important structure which forms the most important link between the axial and the uh, appendicular skeleton of the upper limb. <clears throat> Along with this, whenever there is uh, the coracoclavicular ligament also has some role in force what transmission the... along the upper limb. That is force transmission know, moves from mm -hmm. hand to radius, then interosseous membrane, then ulna, then humerus then to scapula and through the coracoclavicular ligament, it goes to the uh, clavicle and from there it goes into the axial skeleton. So <clears throat> whenever there is problem with the coracoclavicular ligament, whole of this homeostasis, whole of this balance is gone. So coracoclavicular ligament is not only important for stability of the shoulder joint complex, this is important even for the stability of the whole of the upper limb. So <clears throat> because as we have already mentioned, the it the the, uh, the clavicle suspends the um, the uh, scapula and whole of the upper limb with the help of the coracoligament. In, in while there is uh, AC joint disruption or AC joint dislocation, it is not the clavicle that goes up; it is the scapula that goes down, as shown in this picture. And, and whenever we reconstruct this joint again, the scapula goes back to its original point. So. <clears throat> This is another important anatomical part, which I think is very important for today's talk. And uh, there has been, this has been a uh, talk of research. This has been a resource topic for very long. And it shows that the two points of the, uh, the conoid and trapezoid uh, coracoclavicular ligament attachment within the clavicle is very, very important for success of the reconstructive procedures. And uh, whatever the length or whatever the actual position of these, uh, the attachment of conoid or trapezoid ligament, but the ratio of conoid center to clavicle length is 0 
and ratio for trapezoid center to the length of the coracoid is usually 0 0.17. And this is whatever the uh, position of the conoid or trapezoid attachment within the clavicle in any in anybody, the ratio remains the same. So this is also another important uh, anatomical uh, point which we, we must know uh, while dealing with the cases of AC joint injury. So let us discuss something about the bionic, biomechanics of this AC joint. This AC joint uh, seems to be very simple joint, very small joint on X-rays. But what happens is this, this AC joint is the very complex joint with complex range of motion. This has multiple range of motion. This is the vertical range of motion within the vertical axis in which there is anterior and posterior, uh, uh, posterior opening of the joint. The anterior opening is limited by anterior uh, AC ligament along with the uh, trapezoid component of the CC ligament. The posterior opening is uh, prevented by the posterior AC ligament. Similarly, this, this is the uh, transverse axis of movement and it moves, it opens up these AC ligaments upward and downward. The upward uh, opening is prevented, a uh, further up, upward opening is prevented by upper uh, superior AC ligament and the clavipectoral fascia. And the third movement is the rotational movement. And this rotational movement, excessive rotational movement is controlled by CC ligament and superior and inferior uh, the superior and inferior AC ligament. So uh, though it seems as a small joint, though it seems as very petty joint, there are many motions that is possible within this joint. And because of this synchronous motion of this uh, coracoid AC ligament, AC joint, along with the scapular thoracic joint, the smooth movement of the whole of the shoulder joint complex is possible. So whenever the conclusion is, since this is a joint, there should be movement. So any type of fixation, any type of treatment in which this joint is, uh, this joint is compromised, the movement of this joint is compromised, is bound to fail in the future. If so, take home misses, AC joint is has complex range of motion and makes a suspensory complex of shoulder joint. Surgery to AC joint injury must address both CC and AC ligaments. And these type of fixation in which AC fixation uh, in which the movement of AC, AC joint is compromised is bound to fail in future. Thank you so much uh, for mm -hmm. kind attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bivek, for a very short and sweet uh, presentation on uh, basic anatomy and the biomechanics. Uh, so I will request our participants uh, to put up their questions uh, mm -hmm. into the chat box and would request, uh, uh, you know, our faculties. Uh, Asis Babul Karsar and Vivek Pandey sir to intervene any time and then um, you know clarify and ask any question. Uh, Vivek, you want to say uh, some anatomical consideration on uh, you know um, AC joint or CC ligament? Yeah, I think I will um, start saying that you know this talk is already you know in biased for Ashish Babulkar, you know because Ashish is very uh, you know strong proponent of this uh, restoration of horizontal stability, especially in the chronic cases. Uh, acute remains a bit debatable, but he's very, very strong proponent for long that we must uh, restore the horizontal stability apart from the vertical. And that may be one reason those who do not restore the horizontal stability, why maybe their grafts fail because my initial few failed. <clears throat> um, you know, it did stretch out and then I started using, you know, uh, putting it across the AC joint. And then probably those incidences have come down. So that is, I think, one of the very important takeaway what uh, Rajiv said, that one must try to remember that it is not only the vertical stability, but it is also the horizontal stability. We must be uh, taken in account, especially if you are doing the, you know, the chronic reconstructions. So I think that is one of the very important takeaway. And the last was what Rajiv said, anything which crosses the joint um, and left like that is has got a very high chance of failure especially those k wires. So we will touch upon this when we will have the treatment part. But since he has brought the anatomy and biomechanics, I think that makes a sense that why these treatments should be, you know, done with the utmost caution or, you know, kind of in modern orthopedic, they should be kind of condemned. Yes, Ashish. Uh, yes, I'm with you. I think uh, most aspects of shoulders, Vivek and me think alike and we match up with uh, our uh, philosophy and treatment of shoulder problems. So I'm endorsing everything. The most important slide that Vivek showed was 
the anatomical distance. Normally we render that as a theoretical slide and we don't remember, but that 45 mm conoid and 25 mm trapezoid is a very important metric that we must remember. And I will reinforce that when I come back to the clock, uh, to my talk. And so that uh, everybody will take home and I will try and justify why it is so important. Thank you. Ashish, my, uh, this, uh, the ratio thing, what he was talking um, that I've read, but that only one concern is, you know, unless and until you have a very standardized X-ray, you know, which is taken always, you know, in slightly because clavicle is not a straight bone. It's a curvilinear bone. So on a cadaver, it is easy to measure, but I have always found it, you know, interesting concept, but found it very difficult to measure, you know, so maybe yeah, in adult, as you said, now you take that 45 and 25 relatively standard kind of thing, yeah. a millimeter here on the change, but that ratio thing, I, I don't know how to measure. So maybe Raj, Rajiv can tell us, how do we measure that? Um, it, <clears throat> I think he's asking to Vivek uh, Basukula. Vivek, I think. Vivek Basukula. Uh, Vivek, Vivek, yes. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Vivek. Yeah. So that was the cadaveric, uh, cadaveric dissection paper from of cadaveric dissection paper uh, published in AJSM, sir. And uh, it uh, measures various distances from the lateral end of the clavicle. And uh, what it uh, what it showed was whatever the length or whatever the distance of those attachment would be, but the ratio were always constant. So always try to take the length. But uh, as you already as you have mentioned, uh, it is in X-ray it is very very difficult to take the actual thing because a slight change in the direction of uh, that thing. Right. Will change so that has always you know baffled me where yes. exactly you know maybe we can put those. Yes. Yes. But, yes. Yeah, so in adult, adult clavicle, I think, as Ashi said, now it's almost constant a little bit here and there, and I think it should be all right. Yes, sir. Uh, absolutely. So uh, thank you. We'll come back to these questions again when Babul Karsar will present his, you know, uh, concept of anatomical and uh, those kind of reconstruction or uh, again. Uh, so with uh, uh, due respect uh, to Vivek Basukala, who presented really well his uh, brief uh, presentation on anatomy. May I request Dr. Sushil Thapa? He'll be basically talking on classification of AC joint, their uses in decision making. Uh, so I think the Vivek's uh, slide on animation were quite fascinating. Very fascinating. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, I think I'm audible and uh, visible as well. Yes. Good evening and namaste. Uh, myself, Sushil Thaba from Bharatpur Hospital. My talk is straightforward. It's on basically on the classification of the AC joint injuries and the significance of this classification. The most common mode of injury of the AC joint is uh, the fall on the shoulder tip. This is a vascular player who has uh, just fallen on his shoulder tip with the uh, arm adducted. So not only in the sports, but in other modes of injury where this mechanism comes into play, the AC joint may get injured. Uh, this is the agreement process, while this is the clavicle, while the red oval structure represents the coracoid process. So once he falls against the ground, there is this inferior directed force across the acromion process. So this force is going to push the acromion process along with the end sc scapula downwards. So this, this puts the pressure on the, uh, this uh, AC ligament, acromion clavicular ligament. So this gets sprain either sprained or gets disrupted and as the force continues as the velocity of force continues the acromion process along with the anti scapula that tends to move further downwards thereby injuring or disrupting the coracoclavicular ligament as well this one represents the conoid while the lateral one trapezoid of course and if the force further increases downwards then not only, not only the AC ligament and the CC ligament, but also the trapezius, trapezius and deltoid. This one is trapezius, while the green structure represent, represents the deltoid. These get disrupted as well. So, so 
relatively the the acrimin process along with the scapula moves downwards so the clavicle relatively moves upwards so this is the least severe form of ac joint injury while the right extreme this represents the most severe ac joint injuries and it's very interesting sometimes the patients present with the arm adducted and the opposite the injured arm being supported by his normal uh, normal contralateral arm and this this also uh, this this resembles with the mechanism of injury and there have been several classifications given by uh, uh, Tossi, Rockwood, and Sanders as well. And the Rockwood classification has been considered one of the most handy and one of the uh, easiest one and uh, very easy for communication purpose and other purposes. So we've been very familiar uh, about the classification, the purposes of classification. One of the most questions, common questions we were asked during our residency the the whole purpose of classification is to uh, communicate with our colleagues uh, to prognos prognosticate the uh, injury to plan the uh, treatment protocol well um, this is type 1 injury in which this ac ligament is just sprained while the cc ligaments are intact this is rockwood type 1 classification and uh, this may be, this is diagnosed clinically most of the times by uh, eliciting tenderness uh, over the site of AC joint. And the studies say that if you want to confirm it radiologically, we may have to go for MRI of the uh, AC joint, which is usually not done. And type two is uh, given by this AC ligament has been uh, disrupted and there is sprain of the CC ligament here. Again, the sprain can be diagnosed clinically. And to further confirm it radiologically, we may need to go for MRI, which is again, not done. But in type three, both the AC ligaments and the CC ligaments are torn or disrupted. And this is the type four AC joint the injury. This is again, Rockwood classification. And now in this classification, the clavicle not only displaces superiorly, but there is some degree of posterior displacement as well. But how do we identify the posterior displacement just only from the AP view? So this is a fallacy of the Rockwood classification. It doesn't give us the 3D picture of the AC joint injury. But to confirm it, we can advise for axillary lateral view, which, which can show the posterior displacement of the clavicle. So this gives us to some, uh, to some extent an idea about the, um, not only on the superior displacement, but also the posterior displacement of the clavicle. Well, in type five, there is a disruption, a disruption of the uh, AC ligament, conoid trapezoid, as well as the deltoid and trapezoid fascia. So this has gone way upwards. This is type five and type six, which is the rare one, it has gone beneath the coracoid process. This is the, the, the rare one classification. Let me deal with them one by one. Uh, this is type one classification, AC ligament sprain, while the coracoid clavicular ligament is intact here. While uh, in type two, uh, the AC ligament is disrupted here completely. There is discontinuity in the ligament and this is only sprained. The sprained ligament has been represented by the waviness of the ligament. And another important consideration is the coracoclavicular distance. So we need to take, in fact, the X-ray so that we can compare the coracoclavicular distance of the injured side and the normal side. This is called CC distance, also called coracoclavicular distance. In type one, this is normal, while in type two, the distance may be increased by up to 25%. Uh, though the AC ligament, this offers the anterior posterior stability only, but in some cases, uh, the, this may be displaced slightly superiorly. And this superior displacement is quantified by measuring the coracoclavicular distance. And we should not forget to compare with the normal side always. 
So the treatment, of course, is the analgesic, eyes and rest. The rest for type 2 is slightly longer than for the type 1. The, the literature say that uh, the rest for type 1 is approximately one week and for type 2 is slightly longer. They don't say how long, it, is it two weeks or 10 days, but they suggest that the, the immobilization in arm pulse is for more than one week for type 2. And this is type 3 in which both the, both the ligaments have been disrupted and the coracoclavicular distance. This distance is 25 to 100 percent is as com in contrast to the type 2, which is less than 25 percent. And besides these ligaments, the deltopectoral fascia also get disrupted in type 3. And the treatment is very debatable. This is the type which, which demands some more attention as compared to all the six types of the Rockwood classifications. And uh, it may be conservative or it may be operative. There are a bunch of factors that help us decide whether to go for conservative management or operative management. Some authors suggest we should give a trial for three to four months, but others say that if, if the significant deformity is present, if there is a skin tenting on the lateral end of the clavicle and the pain is persistent, and if the functional demand is high, let's say the sports person or the ones who need climbing activities, then we should go straight forward for the operative management. But how to quantify? These are actually subjective. How to make it objective? Then uh, there is another committee, the ISACOS Upper Extremity Committee consensus. They came up with a consensus. They say, we give a fair trial of conservative management for the next three, three to six weeks after we diagnose the ACJ injury. And then we evaluate clinically as well as radiologically this patient. And if the, if the pain is persistent, if the individual is not able to return to his work or sports, and if there is scapular dyskinesics and cross-body iridoxin radiographs is also done, then these points are suggestive to help us diagnose, uh, to help us decide whether to continue the conservative management or go for the operative management. This is scapular dyskinesis. As Bivik said, there is synchronous scapulothoracic movement. So if uh, in type three AC joint injury, if there is a uh, prominence of the inferior medial border of the scapula, this is basically because of the internal rotation of the scapula, then uh, this is called scapular dyskinesis. And there are other factors like sick scapular syndrome, which help us diagnose that there is something wrong with the AC joint biomechanics. Then this is one of the factors that help us a diagnose that uh, we should go for the operative management. And cross-body iridoxin radiographs. This is also called Bassomania view. And this is done by iridoxin of the affected extremity. And there is some degree of overriding of the lateral clavicle against the acrimen process. This is the overriding, the, uh, the also called Bassomania view. If these are present, then this is 3B. And this is unstable type of AC joint injury. And this requires operative management. While if these are not present, then this is stable type of AC joint type three injury, also called 3A and 3B. So we should go for operative surgery for unstable and continue the conservative manage for, management for the stable type. Again, this has to be assessed individually and, and also based on the surgeon's choice, surgeon's expertise as well. Uh, other eminent speakers will of course shed light on, on these factors as well. At type 5 and type 6, these are rare varieties of Rockwood AC joint injury, while type uh, 5 is more common type and uh, there is more than of course 100% dispersion of the clavicle. And another important factor to consider is these are high velocity injuries as compared to the other types of the AC joint injuries. And we should not forget to look for slab lesions. And if necessary, we should advise for the MRI as well. Because uh, if we treat the, the AC joint and uh, leave the slab lesions as such, then the patient, the, the, the outcome may not be satisfactory. There may be pain somewhere else. So the other lesions in these high velocity injuries should also be considered. And uh, treatment, of course, is operative management of these 
four, five, and six uh, type of ACG injuries. So type three is more debatable and controversial, which has to be taken into account very meticulously. And this is a very brief presentation of the ACG injuries. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sushil, uh, for you know uh, refreshing and brushing our memories of um, the Rockwood classification. Uh, may I ask uh, Asis Babulkar, sir? So, what is uh, his take on Rockwood's classification? Amit, uh, Rockwood's is standard, universal, and uh, we use Rockwood classification all the time. And uh, I think we find it very useful. And because we talk across the board, across nations. We are all talking the same language, but uh, when our fellows tell me that you have a type one, type two in emergency, then I know very clearly that what is to be done. Um, the importance of uh, the classification was because we are very clear on type one and type two not to operate. And we are very clear on type four and type five and possibly type six to always operate. The controversy and large part of today's discussion, I'm afraid, it will be up more time. Uh, thank you very much. I have some slides on, you know, discussion on classification and its usefulness is correlation with the X-rays, you know. Uh, so I uh, will discuss more on this when we come to the discussion part. So let me take the privilege of inviting a very good friend of mine and the uh, your brain of Arthroscopy Society of Nepal, the Scientific Committee Chairman of Arthroscopy Society of Nepal, Dr. Sailaz Ranjitkar, who will talk and try to explain us about the role of conservative management in AC joint injury. Uh, Dr. Sailaz, if you can share your screen and start uh, presenting. I must apologize. I'm in the dark, actually, electricity problem. So I've just been having problems here. So uh, I'll share my screen. I'm working on a battery. Um, is that out? Can you Absolutely. hear me? Absolutely, yes. Yes, yes we can see. We see. We can see your slides. Hi. Um, well, I'm Silaj. Um, well, that was very kind of Amit to introduce me to that extent, and uh, I think um, the, the people behind the screen is Vivek and everyone running around. I'm just a person in front. Uh, well, uh, thanks for letting me talk about a small topic. Um, well, I've, I've put this picture up here um, just to make us aware that shoulder is such a big space and we're talking about a small teeny weeny space right in the middle of the shoulder out there. And why is the AC joint so important? Um, a lot of my talk is very similar to what Sushil has just said, and there's a bit of repetition here and there, so please bear with me. Um, so why is this AC joint important? It, as you can see, the clavicle is nothing but a strut. It's like a ballet dancer, I would say. Um, ballet dancer on the tip of the toes, that is the AC joint and it's balancing at two ends of the thorax. And it's got minimal movement and it's a passively moving mechanism out there. And this mechanism has probably been discussed by Vivek, uh, which I, I missed his presentation because of the load shedding. Um, and there's an upward movement uh, at the scapular thoracic area of the posterior tilt and various passive movements that go around at at the AC joint, uh, and that is why AC joint is so important. Um, and thus, if the AC joint doesn't function properly, then your elevation of an arm, um, there would be an impingement problem. Um, so it has to maintain the subacromial space. So that is why the AC joint is so important. And if it doesn't function properly, if the passive movement is out of control, then there will be uh, the, di the, the dynamic part of the, the shoulder, that is the muscles at the scapulothoracic and glenohumeral joint, they, they, they will be, a, um, that dynamic control will cause an acromial impingement. So uh, we, we are gonna spend uh, such a long time talking about a small joint, you can see why it is so important. So 
on that basis, we've talked about the Rockwood classification and everything, so I will not talk about it. So um, if we continue looking at all these classifications, we've talked about whether they need surgery or not. So should we be operating on all of them? There has been a discussion previously, and we're going to talk a little bit about it. So natural history of one and two that we talked about is that we see that there's full recovery there. But there's always a problem in one and two. It's about what we need to counsel our patients. You, according to the paper, they've seen that about 27% of patients at one and two will need some sort of a surgical procedure in future. There's persistent pain and 42% actually do not go back to work or sports. So considering this and the instability and pain problem because the symptomatic patients have degeneration and ossification at the CC joint area, uh, CC ligament and osteolysis, it is important to not only uh, put up a blanket rule saying that one and two will not need surgery. Yes, they do not need surgery, but while counseling the patient, it will be also necessary to tell them that in spite of all the conservative measures, the physiotherapy and everything that you do, you may, as there's a small chance that you may need some procedure to be done to that area in future. You may not need it, but you may need it too. So that is a part we need to understand about mainly two, more than one, it is uh, the type two variety, which may give some issue to the patient in future. Now, we're gonna talk about, as we talk about controversy of type three, I put up a photo on the left. You can see this, um, he's a pitcher from the major league baseball. And this is a study from that group of patients. Of patients. And uh, on the dominant arm, this is a 1997 paper. And uh, it has been seen that in type three, in spite of whatever at, uh, people aggressive at that level of sports still improve and they do very well with non-operative treatment and 90% develop normal range of movement. Now you may say that this is from 1997 and the surgical treatment was very different. But if you look at the same group of people uh, down in 2018, they had sim similar sort of a outcome with the sa same group of uh, studies that were done. So uh, type three, yes, we have got 3A and 3B. We look at the unstable variety, uh, but it is important that we do not forget that conservative management does help. And now you may consider saying that, okay, this, this, is, this is a level four study. Okay, this 2012 paper looked at 24 articles and he, the problem with our, our study at till this level is that we didn't have any RCTs. So he wanted to do actually a, a, liter a literature review, um, but he couldn't because he couldn't find any RCTs at that time. So whatever literature he got at that time, he showed that conservative was better uh, than the usual surgical at uh, type three injuries, one to three injuries. Similarly, I picked up another from two, 2017. These had RCTs and the surgical, there was a recurrence rate of surgical in the surgical group of about 14%. So this showed the same result, followed by this paper uh, that is in 2018, which compared two group of pa patients that was the conservative with the various casts and Kennyworth splints and slings and the different types of surgeries, including tight rope and hook plate. And it was a study on uh, a meta-analysis on 10 studies, but three RCTs only, six retrospective, one prospective studies. Still conservative was better. But in the previous study, though conservative was better, the, the uh, the surgical group had less pain. That, that was an important thing to be found in the previous paper. Now, as we said, four, five, six, we've gone through three. And uh, now four, five, six, surgical that we always say AC joint separation, do poorly with operative 
without operatory intervention as that. So considering that it's gonna be surgery, surgery and surgery. That's what Mr. Burns would say. But yes, surgery has a lot of monetary advantages, but it's also important to consider, do we need surgery in every patient? And is conservative an important primary factor? So surgery can get bad, as you can see, not the best of things. You have to be aware that surgery can cause a problem and can cause problem in orthopedics too. So do remember that ortho conservative is an important, I've put up this paper from Can uh, the Canadian paper. Uh, he's compared non-operative with operative. In grade three, four, and five, the DASH scores, constant scores was better with the conservative. Radiographically, yes, operative was much better when you look at it. It doesn't mean that every time you operate, you're gonna get a better result. So this multi-center uh, study, which showed that conservative treatment at high grade AC joint instability may not necessarily be associated with clinical outcomes compared to temporary hook plate retention. Yes, this is on hook plates and there are more modern things that I'm sure uh, we will learn from our um, uh, our presenters who will be uh, talking about the surgical part of it. And we're very glad to have uh, such uh, esteemed uh, people uh, talking to us today. Uh, well, that is one part of it. And you can see that in, uh, I've put up a few discussions from the German papers where they uh, have put it as a relative indication of surgery for four and five. Uh, in contrast from the US um, the, a statement was put up that they normally would go for cons conservative. And since they have a lot of allograft, uh, that is the reason first they would always try conservative, then only go on to do more of a ligament reconstructive process than just a, um, uh, immediate, than just drop into a surgical procedure. So I think it's important. Do we really need the surgery? And what, as uh, the conservative measures that we've already talked about by the previous uh, speakers is very simple. So I think it's important to think about, yes, patients mean, may need surgery, but conservative should not be ruled out. Always think what the patient wants. You may want, the surgeon may want surgery, but the patient may have a different view and you have to also understand the patient's, patient's perspective. Um, and simple things like active exercises at three weeks, abduction 90 degrees at six weeks, heavy lifting only after three months. And it, after all in conservative, it's about strengthening the uh, rotator cuffs and the scapular uh, stabilizing exercises. That's very important. And that may actually solve a lot of things before you actually jump into any surgical procedure. So simple pictures that I've put up simple treatment. So take home message, conservative management is a good option. One and two will, can, will be managed well with conservative, but it's important to also talk about what may happen in future. Three, conservative is a very good outcome, has very good outcome, though some people may have problems which, who would need surgery. Four, five, six, surgery is an accepted procedure, but not to forget about conservative movement, uh, conservative treatment. I think that's all I have to say. Do enjoy the autumn leaves. They're really beautiful out there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sailas, for you know, bringing a small food for thought uh, for all of us um, that uh, these injuries can very well be managed conservatively as well. So Sailas, if you can stop sharing your screen, we can ask our you know, esteemed panelist a uh, few questions. Uh, I'm looking for the thing. Where do I go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go a little up, you'll find out the stop. Yeah, no. That's it. So again, a uh, question is to, you know, first to uh, Vivek Pandey and then Asis Babulkar, sir. So when we are talking about three, four, so let's talk about uh, type three. So how do you decide this patient particularly is going with uh, surgical management or you are conserving that patient? Okay, Asis, so, uh, sorry, Amit, um, 
recently in last i think uh, two years uh, we have been doing this uh, you know the oblique views you know the so called basmania views and uh, we are trying to see whether it really makes a difference so okay let me put it in another way the people who are more than 50 55 um, who do not you know into much of these sports or heavy lifting just ordinary you know the asian typical male or i mean men or women who are fine they don't have any deformity so we just conserve them so as uh, shellish rightly said that not everybody needs a surgery and you should choose your patient wisely especially when it is 3 other than that you know it's like it's it will remain debatable but 3 we yes uh, not everybody we operate we hold on but if it is showing a very high grade you know a lot of deformity uh, sometimes we take a stress view uh, though stress view in our own shoulder society there is a lot of debate about stress view but i do take stress view and if i find what looks 3 on holding the you know the 6 pound 6 to 10 pounds if it displaces to almost 100% more he's a young man whom yeah it's it's hard to predict you know what will happen after one year because i personally i am in more favor of you know immediate giving a chance of healing in terms of either i do the dog button or hook plate or whatever for that patient rather than actually you know aiming for a reconstruction later after few months so yes that's how i decide but 4 5 6 in general unless they are above 50 55 i do offer them surgery ashish your turn right uh thank you amit vivek uh, the one and two are no no challenge they are clear black and white for me they'll always be conserved type 3 again we have to pick and choose the right patient now the dilemma here is that i am not hard pressed to fix most of them but if i leave them out and they come back after 6 months or one year then their reducibility is a problem so newer latest uh, articles published in jcs suggest that the earlier you go in the more likely that you will get it bang into position and the biggest problem now is that the sum of the reduction is lost and they have a 20% 30% difference looks non anatomical wasting is there that's why the bone remains prominent but i let the patient choose it so if i have a 60 65 year old i'm going to send him back home many of them now the females among them are going to come in early because it's a cosmetic problem it shows they don't like it so it's a very easy solution for me the young males those who come with medial scapular pain or very similar to what sailat said about a six scapular syndrome these are the patients who come because of disruption of scapular biomechanics can be treated with a rehab uh in stage 3 and they need a good scapular control on their um, scapular dyskinesia if they don't do well then i would operate them there are some who are athletes or who want to do crazy gym for them day one they must get operated so i'll wait for about 10 15 days let everything settle down and then at two weeks operate those they are very clear so it's a horses for courses policy Uh, absolutely so for 4 5 6 uh, suppose a patient of 60 year old uh, type 5 uh, ac joint uh, uh, how would you manage sir uh, for me i would uh, definitely operate them irrespective of age uh, and i would do the biological fixation that i am going to talk about and i like to recreate anatomy no implants in this age group they are osteoporotic the percentage of uh, prevalence of complications on coracoid fracture and clavicle fracture is very high in this elderly age group so avoid metal work as far as possible uh thank you very much sir we'll we'll come back to these questions once uh amit can i can i ask a question to both our yes, faculties sir. can i can i ask a question yes yes uh, sir, uh, rajiv you can uh, go sir, ahead ask yeah thank you amit with your permission basically before we move on to the surgical management i think the talks on surgical management are beginning so one query that i actually had was now what about mri sir in the acute setting because a lot of these injuries they are high high energy injuries and uh, some of them are associated with uh, so called slap lesions and rotator cuff lesions so how uh, often should we always send for an mri before we uh, uh, after we see the patient or how does it go how, how, what what is your view sir Rajiv, it's a very good question. There are a couple of papers published. One by Marker Scheibel from Berlin, um, where they said 20% incidence of collateral lesions along with this. We have found 
ten percent lesions, mostly slap tears, partial cuff tears. If you are, since I do it arthroscopically, I'm not so pushed because my scope is going to go in. I will see it, and then I would treat it. So not such a big challenge. But even then, we had a major issue when we went in for a young girl, and I'll try and show her case to you. And we realized that we were doing X-rays only, and she was 17, and she had a coracoid fracture. And because there's a coracoid fracture, the procedure couldn't be done, or whatever we did just didn't work out. So. now in affording patients so who are insurance covered we just do a mri just to rule out a coracoid fracture because it's always subtle but i don't think it's mandatory if you are an open surgeon then you have to be careful because if you're not going to scope you could always do a scopy diagnostic take it out and then do an open it's highly recommended thank thank you sir thank you uh rajiv i'll just uh, come in for a while um as ashi said uh, probably he you know his numbers are high so he has got about 10% mine is probably less than 2 or 3% i do a lot of dog buttons and um, i have rarely found till date anybody you know because slap itself if you see the typical when you talk about the slap the typical you know the snider type 2 that is extremely rare i can tell you it is extremely rare really we have found sometimes you know posterior superior labral is a bit on the posterior side if he is an elderly man anybody who has got an acj you know or a shoulder injury who is above 40 it is important that you rule out a rotator cuff tear you know see the slap tear 21 hours sorry the slap tears are hardly a concern most of the time they are all degenerative slap in so many arthroscopies i have never found except one except one never anybody had a slap tear rotator cuff tear one partial yes some fraying here and there and as she said you know you are anyway going to scope it so i mean lo- most of the shoulder surgeons do put a scope if you any put a scope in if you find a partial tear just debride it a slap tear and those are almost always you know they type to degenerative because you have to be very very careful about this mri slap tears and remember in presence of a acj injury you cannot evaluate them clinically there is no sign which will give you consistent finding so how do we know that it was already pre existing slap itself is a questionable diagnosis and on top of that you can't do you know the, the so called you know the obrans or anything so i think you have to very take it with a pinch of salt thank you sir uh, absolutely i think uh, these question was kept in discussion part and rajiv has brought it uh, now uh, uh thank you rajiv um, we'll again come to come to this point uh, when we uh, go ahead so now my job is to talk little bit about uh the surgical principles uh, this is just a thought process uh, uh, that is uh, going on and then we have been working on this thought process so i'll briefly talk about principle of surgical management of ac joint injury uh uh vivek basukala my slides are visible and i am audible yes yes sir okay so uh when we talk about acromioclavicular joint again to reiterate it and again and again which is very very important to understand that it has a coracoclavicular ligament both conoid and trapezoid as well as it has a uh, acromioclavicular ligament as well and then since these ligaments are so important not only for the stability of the um, ac joint but also for the cc joint so coracoclavicular ligament is basically responsible for the vertical displacement so if the ac joint is horizontally unstable then your reconstruction or repair of only the cc ligament is not going to help probably you have to extend your repair system into the ac ligament as well that is the whole basic and the current debate on this one probably um, vivek and uh, ashish sir will uh, definitely highlight on this so what happens when there is a grade 3 and above injury we have to understand that um, rock would very clearly mention that uh, there is a both ac ligament as well as the cc ligament is torn so whenever you are dealing with these injuries you keep this mind in our mind when we start doing surgery but the important is uh, the principle of treatment for me uh, depends upon basically two things these are either acute either this is a acute injury that means are they presented to you within 3 weeks or it is a chronic that is more than 3 weeks so let's see this animation what happens if it is uh, acute when you reduce this clavicle 
to its normal position, then these acutely torn ligament has a potential of healing and then this ligament heals. This is the whole principle of treating uh, the, you know, AC dislocation with uh, the repair procedures. Either you do a dog button or you put a K wire across the AC joint, whatever method you indirect reduction of this AC joint will allow healing of this ligament. And based upon this principle, all this one major chunk group of surgery is divided into this one. What happens in the chronic case, if it is a chronic one, so these ligaments are absorbed. So these are chronically, and then there is a fibrosis. So even if you reduce this ligament, it is not going to heal. So non-healing of this ligament will take place. So if your uh, stabilization devices are very rigid one, or not the biological fixation devices, they are bound to fail, or after removal of the implant, the AC joint will again dislocate. So this is the basic principle of uh, AC joint um, injuries and the treatment modalities can be divided into that one. So again, to re-emphasize the one principle that I wanted to highlight today is if it is less than three weeks, which is acute injuries, it has healing potential. Although there are lots of debate on this as well, either these ligament will heal or not. There are a lot of debate, but the principle is these acutely torn ligament has healing potential. So if we maintain the AC and CC alignment till the ligament heal, then the implant can be very safely be removed and then the range of motion of the patient can be allowed. On contrast, if it is more than three weeks time, there is no healing potential. So if there is no healing potential, then your reduction methods, reduction of AC and CC, CC um, you know, ratio is not going to help you out. So you have to supplement with a biological reconstruction of the ligament, which probably a um, bubble cursor will more highlight on this aspect. So this is a uh, one uh, video, um, you know, paper that we have uh, submitted to Arthroscopy Society of Nepal, sorry, for, um, you know, uh, uh, the Arthroscopy Journal, Arthroscopy Technique. And then this has been accepted for publication. I'm going to show you uh, this video of ours, which has been accepted for arthroscopy technique. Uh, this is a arthroscopic assisted all suture coracoclavicular and AC ligament reconstruction in acute uh, shoulder joint injuries, acute AC joint injury. This was a 32 year uh, old uh, gentleman, Rockwood 4. In this technique, what we do is, uh, let me tell you, we pass a fiber tape underneath the coracoid and take two loops of these uh, fiber tape, one anterior to it and the other one is posterior to it. Then we reduce the uh, AC joint, provisionally stabilize the AC joint and then tie this fiber tape over the clavicle without making any drill hole into the clavicle, which again, making drill holes will have some technical issues and the issues with the complication. Then this uh, take care of the CC um, part. Then we extend our um, surgery into the acromion. We make two drill holes into the acromion, then pass our suture tape across the AC joint through the acromion and tie it over. And this is how it looks like um, in the diagrammatic representation. So for all uh, practical purposes, this has six distinct steps. Uh, step two is the shuttling of fiber tape provisional stabilization of the AC joint. Then we tie the knot over the clavicle. Then we go to the uh, acromion, pass our suture across the acromion and tie it over across the joint. So this was a surgical uh, video. This is a right shoulder and uh, through the rotator interval, we are trying to expose the coracoid. This is the under surface of the coracoid. And at this point, we make a um, anterolateral portal accessory anterolateral portal and put a cannula over it. So from here, now we can, you know, um, extend our debridement towards the base of the coracoid. Once the under surface and the lateral surface of the coracoid is, you know, cleared arthroscopically, then we go to the superior part of the coracoid. So this is the superior part of the coracoid after releasing the CA ligament. And at this point, when we release and clear superior part of the coracoid, then we give a vertical incision into the 
a clavicle and through that incision we introduce our radio frequency ablator gradually clean into the medial uh, border of the coracoid and then make a window into the pec minor so once the window into the pec minor is done then you pass your wissinger rod and the replace that wissinger rod with the dilator so this is a dilator is been uh, used and through the dilator we passed proline which is a stout suture and then we take it out into the anterior lateral portal all the way the scope is in the posterior portal so using that proline you shuttle the uh, fiber tape underneath the coracoid and take out the other end of the coracoid by doing the same but this time it's more easier approach you are not going into the medial side of the coracoid but you are coming onto the lateral side of the coracoid and you can see that this way we have already looped our fiber tape so this is the arthroscopic part then you go open this uh, the previously open incision uh, a vertical incision above the clavicle take this suture tape since it was both anterior to the clavicle you take it one to the posterior then you make another incision in over the ac joint expose the ac joint reduce temporarily stabilize probably you just do a little bit of over reduction and tie this fiber tape over the clavicle then you shuttle uh, this fiber tape from the clavicular incision to the acromial incision and then do a subacromial scopy just do a little bit of um, you know borsal release and do a superior to inferior drill holes which is about 1 cm lateral from the <laughs> ac joint then you pass shuttle uh, again the uh, one end of the fiber tape now it's going from superior to inferior and coming out from the anterior uh, lateral uh, cannula then about 1 cm behind the previous hole then you make another hole the second hole which is again from superior to inferior on the acromion shuttle again the proline so that you can take out the limb which is in the anterior lateral portal to the acromion so now this is looping um, across the ac joint underneath the acromion then in the over reduced position you tie your knot over here right above the ac joint so the knot is being tied and then if you can see that after the uh, then after the surgery you take out your k wire and then you'll see that this this is the uh, fiber wire a uh, fiber tape which is crossing right across the ac joint and this is the incision uh, you can see that this is clavicular and the acromial incision this is pre and post op surgery Uh, this paper has been accepted for uh, arthroscopy technique with very good remarks and soon will be available for everybody to watch it so again uh, if it is a chronic case we do the same procedure but at that time we use a semi tendinosus graft and replace uh, along with the fiber tape we use the semi tendinosus graft to pass across both cc and the ac joint um at the at the same time using both the um the semi tendinosus as well as the fiber tape so again for me uh, the principle of treatment is very simple if you get them acute you have a possibility that these ligament will heal if you reduce into the place it will heal and will stabilize ac joint in due course of time but if it is chronic if it is a chronic one then your stabilization method is not going to help you out you have to do a proper ligament reconstruction uh thank you very much thank you very much sir okay i don't see any any question uh, vivek you have some question or uh, we should go ahead uh, with the presentation because we are running little 15 20 minutes late no no sir there are no questions in the chat box at present okay so may i may i request then uh, without any further delay may i request dr vivek pandey to you know present his uh, talk thank you amit uh, it was indeed a fantastic presentation and that has given me an lb you know to you know to stand in front of ashish because ashish is uh, 
acute or chronic, he is a proponent of biological reconstruction straight away. So, <clears throat> I uh, my talk will be a synthesis of Bibek's and partly yours, and then I will not touch upon what Ashish is going to discuss. Um, so, without much delay, let's start the. Okay, right, share. So, is my screen visible, um, Amit? Yes, Vivek. Yes, yes, visible. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Amit, um, for the invitation. And uh, you know, it's always pleasure to meet you, uh, whether it is online or you know, someday definitely offline, very soon once the things are fine. And let's let's catch up if you know if Ashish is um, the conference is is definitely on the way. Okay. So. This is what Vivek has already discussed. These are the two important ligaments which stabilize the, you know, the acromion and the clavicle, that is the CC ligaments and the capsule. I'll not go much into this. Classification has been very, you know, elegantly dealt. Ax the views typically what we do is AP and axillary view, but I will tell you honestly, this, especially this posterior, you know, the type four, type four has been debated a lot. And I am yet to see one frank type four. How actually you see? Does it really stay there? You know what happens most of the time. Even if it was probably type four, it would have been reduced. Um, axial review has not really helped me. There are also some papers. If you carefully actually see here in this, um, let me have my pen. In this axial review, which is uh, of some different patient, not may not be of this patient here the anterior end of the clavicle is actually matching with the anterior end of the acromion here okay but this is not the case in about 30 uh, percent patient in 30 percent patient it may be somewhere here so it does not always actually match so axial review may not be of the great help for me what helps most is the ap view and i always take the other side which gives me the um, the idea if it is 100 percent more than the normal side then it is probably type 5. So if it is just gone beyond, then it is type three, but if it is hundred percent more, then it is probably type five. So Zanka view again, a lot of debate to do or not do. I personally do not do. This was one recent patient who have actually have operated him today. Uh, so I'm going to show you some important, you know, one of the important videos from the today's uh, now surgery, just evening I finished and came back home. So Zanka view again, I don't do it very routinely once in a while. And that too, mostly for the AC joint arthritis. Stress view remains one of my um, important uh, armamentarium, but I'm going to present a paper soon and say whether the stress view is really helpful or not. Uh, largely, no, not really. Treatment, I think acute one and two, Silas and all of you have already covered and Ashish has said that treatment one and two rough, no one operates and it should not be operated. And in fact, these people do not even need MRI. Um, you know, one question came, should you do to rule out slap tear? Only in elderly, if you are there about 50 and they are not able to elevate their hand, you know, after three or four weeks, when you're really suspecting a big rotator cuff tear, do it. Otherwise, it's not required. Just the rehab suffices. So, um, in four, five, six, uh, I will again not debate and say whether we do or not. I will at the moment say we are doing and I'll discuss what am I going to do. Just let me put in this wish. Yes. Sorry. Okay. So, Type three is remains debatable. Again, I'll not go into the debate. Conservative, generally, if the patient is low demand, he's elderly, or his daily requirement does not demand a very aggressive reuse of shoulder, especially if they are above 35, 30, and 35. Surgical options in acute injury. So, Amit, I am your side. I always believe that largely repair when you, if you can give an opportunity for the natural ligaments to heal. Nothing like that. If the things can heal naturally in the natural format, natural fashion, it is going to restore the biomechanics because the ligaments will retain their proprioception, will retain their original, you know, the biomechanics and the original vascularity. So I do keep all the reconstructive uh, procedures, especially the ST reconstruction only in the chronic cases. And the, the I would agree with the definition of chronic anything beyond three weeks, three to four weeks, because by that time, the ligament ends, whether it is the AC joint capsule or it is the CC ligament, those ends would have become kind of atrophied, lesser vascular. So even if you try to approximate, the healing chances of healing is pretty less. 
and it's not that it will you know it will always heal in all the acute cases but largely they heal and these are the usual current scenario across the globe options which your people are using people are using some or other kind of a suspensory fixation method my at the moment suspensory fixation method of choice is dog button i also use hook plate it has been demonized too much but i will tell you i'm just going to show you my results which you have published recently published in a, a paper that hook plate is demonized too much but it is not that reconstruction has got its own brilliant place um open reduction using the tapes or the you know our dr pande from uk has recently shown that he uses very elegantly the vicryl tapes and i was just wondering those what happens the vicryl tapes because they tend to lose you know a lot of um, strength by 6 to 8 weeks so do they really heal and he says yes it heals you know it gives them a good reduction fair enough uh, and what exactly what you were doing we were done yes a large population still continues to do the we were done both swiss screws are out but what certainly is out is this you know this should not be practiced as far as possible um the left side tension bent wiring even in my institution a group of surgeon continue to do this and they do say it's a, it has good result but they have not been able to prove that so k wires are largely no no and rest we can always discuss so i am going to discuss uh, primarily first the dog button which remains my primary choice uh, reason of dog button being my choice because it works very well within 3 weeks when cc ligament and the ac joint capsule and sarvascular and as you very rightly said the cc ligament and ac joint capsule they heal once they are kept in approximation with limited amount of rehabilitation for first 4 to 6 weeks this can be done arthroscopically beautifully you can always rule out any other injury with a, whether it is a cuff injury or whether it is a slap tear or any other though the incidence is over emphasized it's not really that much quite cosmetic but the most important part what i have understood there is absolutely no need of implant removal which was my problem in hook plate eventually in the hook plate one has to remove the implant the recently what i have understood with my paper because we had certain failures and why i understood that the the just mere arthroscopic dog button fixation is not the panacea because type 5 injuries where the clavicle is really really displaced by 200 or 300% more you know the delto deltoid or trapezial fascia is also quite a lot stretched out so even if you approximate there's a likelihood that once the tape will start wearing off uh, maybe there is too much of stress on the deltoid or trapezial fascia so there is a bit of subluxation and dislocation even in the dog button cases so maybe in type 5 it is a good idea to do the deltoid or trapezial fascia repair uh, ram chidambaram from you know uh, chennai and couple of others also do share this idea that in type 5 it might be good idea to just do a quick repair so this is how it is being done um patient is in b chair position and i preferably do only with the two portal this is the posterior portal which i remains my visualization portal and i use only single anterolateral portal so this is as as you were showing this one comes very close to the actually is consolidated video this comes in opens in the rotate and towel and then we just clean up the whole area go up to the base of the coracoid that's the base of the coracoid exposed this anterior superior part of the labrum is always your beaten oer it keeps coming in front because especially if you are using the single posterior portal but that's how you can expose the entire base of the coracoid next is um we have to so the jig can be passed from the you know the lateral portal and to lateral portal and this top one this is what is important this is your ac joint this is where is ac joint and i have not shown in this but often amit what i do um uh, and this is important for everybody to understand that this procedure is not a reduction tool the dog button procedure is not a reduction procedure one must see that you have reduced it and do not hesitate in pass in reducing it manually and pass a kever what you did because if you have not reduced it you will the the clavicle is often a bit posteriorly placed so what will happen your jig will not sit exactly in that place so i would say in probably in widely displaced once it is best is to reduce pass a kever and then only place the jig and start this so we were discussing in anatomy that the conoid and trapezoids are like 2.5 2.52 4.5 so i usually take the midpoint you know neither this way neither that way so somewhere around 3.5 cm from the from the ac joint 
and then we drill now <clears throat> i always use an image intensifier doing this because i'll tell you in the dog button one of the fallacy is often what happens your drill may go slightly medial it should come somewhere here but if the minute you start drilling in the clavicle itself you should throw a you know a trajectory a virtual trajectory that will i be able to come somewhere in the center or am i going medial if one is going medial immediately change the trajectory because twice or thrice if you have been too close to the medial side what happens that the medial cortex of the crocoid can get fractured if the medial cortex of the crocoid will get fractured you will never come to know because you are actually visualizing from the lateral side once you place the button the button actually flips and goes onto the medial side it happened to me in one of the my very early cases and that's the day i learned that yeah they do propagate it's an arthroscopic procedure but it's always a wise thing to have one or two shot once you have a guide wire in a perfect place then this procedure is over actually it's a you know it's just few more minutes left so we drill always using the engine bench intensifier and then you know the the steps are passed which is almost similar to what you were showing so i'll show a consolidated procedure and then it is being tied so this remains my procedure of choice in the patients who are point number 1 affording uh because you know this is a bit costly procedure patient has to pay in our country uh, unless and until they are insured but those who cannot afford i still do the hook plate and i find it absolutely fine i i have no complaints for that so but given a choice i would do a dog button so this is the you know the you know almost 100 to 100% displacement of the clavicle usually it tends to reduce actually in this um, in the lying down position that's the marking posterior portal anterior portal and this is what we are seeing for the left side posterior portal visualization and that's the clearing a bit you can see a little bit of superior anterior fraying so uh, you know raju you can see this is what sometimes can be reported erroneously as a slap tear and then you start clearing this rotate tantal in fact it's very very neat and clean there's hardly any hematoma you know one must not get scared it's very easy to go in and very very easy to reach the crocoid process just clean up the base if you're using only posterior portal it could be little tricky so don't hesitate in making one more portal where we our uh, the the instruments are coming so you can have two anterolateral portals and this is what i was trying to say see the marking is from the ac joint from the ac joint is about 3 to 3.5 cm and that's where i open the clavicle this is a transverse incision but now these days i make a vertical brass strap incision so that's how you can mark and here one must remember about 1.9 cm from the ac joint 1.9 cm from ac joint is the first branch of the supraclavicular nerve comes okay so if you are vertical there is a likelihood that you are going to not damage those branches if you are horizontal you can damage though these lateral branches are quite flimsy and it doesn't cause any big problem to the patient and then under the you know the vision both arthroscopic as well as the image we place the jig under surface of the jig and then i drill and i always confirm i would say without hesitation i always confirm under the image intensifier because the medial most of the time it has a tendency to go a bit medial never ever accept medial side because it will eventually lead to medial cortex uh, perforation and it can also you know twice or thrice you do it will lead to the damage so once you know that okay it has not gone too far medial you can always go ahead if you feel it's medial change it then we over drill with the um the cannulated drill bit it's important that you protect the under surface of the guide wire with the help of some kind of a curette because right below the coracoid we know that the you know the neurovascular bundle in form of brachial plexus and the artery traverses and then we have these um, shuttling wires which is graft from the lateral portal always have a 8.5 mm cannula on the in the anterolateral portal 
because that's where your uh, buttons will come through and this is how the you know the dock button is so you load two tapes remember two tapes i had certain problems with the single tape though this video shows a single tape double loading but i would prefer today always to use the dual tape system so this if you have a single tape they have a single tape which is very long you can actually make it like a dual system you see it becomes eventually a dual tape kind of a thing but i would still prefer today a dual tape i'm not very confident of this because initially i had two or three you know kind of you know a bit loosening in the due course of time once i switched over to the dual tape my problems are far less and then we just have to pass it i will skip this part not very really important and that button has to sit under the coracoid there's a laser line which should be along the you know the axis of the coracoid and then it is tied from top if it is well reduced easily reducible then you need not to pass a k wire slightest of the problem always pass a k wire and that's how the reduced um, you know the joint looks like the flip side so nothing nothing comes without a problem you know everything has got a flip side so what are the flip side one it's a long learning curve and definitely definitely not for chronic cases it works well within 3 weeks anything beyond 3 weeks then i leave them to the rehab and then see whether they really require the reconstruction or not loss of reconstruct loss of reduction up to few mm can happen hence use two fiber tapes however even if there is some amount of you know subluxation is never a problem but if it dislocates also there is no clinical you know deterioration and that brings back the question what sales was saying saying that you know does it really require a reconstruction fracture of coracoid yes described in literature it has never happened in my hands the second option i do have and i do use it even today i did the hook plate because patient hardly had any money he said you know i'm i'm fine you can use the hook plate and i will come back after an year for the removal so it also keeps the joint reduced for extended period which further lets the cc joint ligament and the ac joint capsule heal with the heal with the fibrosis and this is what is small animation so try to understand here i'll try to you know bust a myth a myth which has been so much propagated that everybody is scared about the hook plate everybody says that it causes impingement where is the proof see one point one must understand that two things can cause impingement where is the hook and what is the length of this part of the hook whether it is 12 15 or 18 largely in asian population you need to have only the 15 mm and you see where the hook goes hook whose hook is actually in this part this is the place where the supra and infra junction and you see this is the spinous process so this is the place where your supra and infra spinous junction is that place the shoulder joint has got immense amount of space i had once an opportunity to do the ac joint reconst the ac joint um, same hook plate fixation and same patient had a large rotator cuff tear so when i went to the subacromial space to see i realized that the hook was actually quite posteriorly placed that is the day i realized that it doesn't cause any impingement and if something is not causing impingement on table in forward flexion it will certainly not cause in post op because you really rehab the rotator cuff and the sub, the the sub, the scapular muscles well so this is how the reduction is done and you see the hook goes quite behind it is not in the front unlike what people think it is the hook is actually quite posteriorly placed behind so unlikely that it causes a reduction cause any impingement unless you have used a very long hook which is about 18 mm most of the time you require only the 15 mm so here the advantage is since it's an open procedure you can repair the dt fascia that is deltoid trapezial fascia and ac joint can be also used in the lateral and clavicle fracture if there is any associated easy surgery less costly the only problem is you have to remove it after in textbook they say about 12 weeks i usually call them at 6 months because i have never found any problem okay i let it heal let it consolidate after 6 months any time you can remove it so this is how you see the and the incision you can make a vertical incision this is today's patient i just now actually uh, kept the videos here this is the vertical incision and this is the deltoid trapezial fascia you can see the tear here and let me run this video after placing the plate 
You see, these are the two ends of the fascia. You have to close it over the plate. You can, and this is the AC joint. Here we can also, you know, repair this the capsule. So this is a small video again. This anatomy you have to remember from the AC joint up to two centimeter you are safe, one point nine centimeter to be very precise. After that, the nerves the start, and you may damage them. The lateral one is very flimsy, doesn't cause much problem. Again, this one is for the a, a horizontal incision. Now I usually do only the with the vertical incision. And most of the time you can manage with two whole hook plates. Sometimes you need three. So today I actually had used three. So this you carefully divide the deltoid or trapezial fascia in the line. Remember, don't cut it vertical. Cut it along the axis of the clavicle. Then this is the clavicle. That is the joint here. This is actually the part of the disc which we'll excise. And this is behind here. That's where the hook goes. It's not in the front. So that you place the hook first and try to see in the image whether the placement is perfect or not. Because this can be misleading sometimes once, once somebody did and they you know actually put the hook outside very, very at the edge. It has to really slip in. You have to really push it hard laterally. Confirm always in the image intensifier that you are right under the clavicle. If necessary, always reduce and hold with the K wire, which I did actually today also. And then you fix with first yellow screw and then followed by yellow and cortical screws. What's the flip side here? So-called impingement. I have not found any initial days. I was very slow in mobilization. So one or two of my patient became stiff, which when I removed, I had to do the adhesiolysis. And after that, I became aggressive in mobilization. So now no more stiffness. The problem is needs to be removed always. I hadn't come across any um, fractures, but yes, if you carefully see, there's always 100% in all our cases, there was a subacromial erosion. But again, that's not a problem because no patient had a problem. This was our result. I'm just quickly showing you when we compared the HP, that is hook plate and double, you know, dog button hook, which had, we had 16 patients each, their scores were almost similar. There was no difference, but the dog button group revealed coracoclavicular distance at the final follow-up compared to the hook plate group. It's, it's very clear because the hook plate will not allow any kind of loss of reduction except for minor. The, although statistically insignificant, there were more subluxations and dislocations in the dog button group as compared to the hook plate group. The subacumal erosion is always noted in all the cases, but usually it does not causes any problem. So this is how you see initially it looks like beautiful <laughs> and then after a few months you may end up this. This was my initial case when I use a single tape. Not that it has not happened with double tape, it has happened with double tape also. Here you have to go a bit slow with the rehab. This is the hook plate you see on the day one looks perfect and then if the, there is too much of pressure or the patient starts doing heavy work, you can see it actually erodes into that. Though I have not found any cutouts till date. We were done historical. I will leave it here for the lack of time. Boss worth completely historical. Nobody does at the moment. ACJ Recon boss is already waiting. You know, he's, you know, he, he will talk about it most appropriate probably for chronic cases, but he loves doing for acute because he says, you know, you replace biology with biology, both auto allograft ST is most preferred. Both can be done open arthroscopic and here you can do both CC and ACJ reconstruction. So my take home message is, Acute cases, as you said, suspensory fixation in any form or hook plate can be done. K wires alone never. Chronic cases, probably ST recon of CC and AC ligament is the best choice. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Uh, thank you, Vivek. I think we'll discuss uh, uh, these things in our discussion part as well, since we are running a little short of time and behind. Uh, I would request uh, Dr. Asis Babulkar to uh, you know, share his screen and start presenting. Thank you, Amit. Um, I think due to time constraints, I shall not uh, beat around the bush. Let us proceed to a stone reconstruction, AB technique. Um, so uh, from Vivek's slide, I think this was the most important measure that we must know that the 
trapezoid is 26 mm from the AC joint and the conoid is 36 mm. So since I prefer a single tunnel on the coracoid, most of the Asian clavicles are not too broad. I would do my tunnel exactly at 35 mm. Just remember this and I will come back to this later. If we want to conserve it, feel free to conserve it. There's no harm in conserving, but please don't strap these. This is what happens with the hope. And there's a lot more hope than science here. And they are strapped and they become stiff and you are ending up treating a frozen shoulder and not the AC joint dislocation. Um, we were done is not tenable, but it's a European procedure. The strength of the CA ligament is almost 20% the strength of the CC ligament. Realistically, the CC ligament, size for size, millimeter for millimeter, is the strongest ligament in the body. Although that award goes to the iliofemoral ligament, size for size, the CC ligament actually transmits weight. And Vivek showed that very nicely in his anatomy lecture. Boss word we shall skip. So this has become the most popular procedure because it is elegant. Uh, it can be done arthroscopically and uh, there, there are implants and because it can be done arthroscopically, uh, it's become more common. And uh, I don't subscribe to it because the most important thing that I believe is that on repetitive cyclic loading, if you don't have a biological structure there, any synthetic material is going to fail. The commonest analogy is if you put in a nail on a femur and the femur doesn't heal, However strong and rigid that nail is, eventually it will break. Because metals are not meant to take cyclic loading. The viscoelastic structures in the body are designed to sustain cyclic loading. And that's my take for biological. Uh, the other important part you must understand is this is our discussion that came from Lauren LaFosse, that no ligaments are usually repaired except for the banker. So when the ACL ligament tears, we rarely ever repair it because we want to replace it. The reason behind this is scientific. Whenever a ligament fails, we must understand the biomechanics of a ligament failure is due to, first, there's a plastic deformation, lengthening, and eventual failure. So once a ligament has lengthened, the collagen has disrupted, it is not capable of providing the same amount of stability. So when it's the MCL in the elbow or the ACL in the knee, or even the lateral ligament in the ankle, we end up using a graft to repair it. And that was my first thought process when I did this procedure in 2002, when I just come back from England and I designed this way back in 2002. And now it is getting validated and almost the pendulum is swinging in favor of a biological ligament. This is a patient that was operated with a uh, tightrope uh, technique and you would see here that uh, this is the post-op x-ray and looks fairly elegant everything has been reduced re reasonably well not perfect and this is him two years later when he came to me uh, everything has failed uh, the implants were removed by the surgeon because they were embarrassing they were under the skin and uh, he came with scapular dyskinesia and already he had undergone two surgeries with no avail so I just put him on rehab and the scapular dyskinesia got covered, but his clavicle is still prominent and up in the air. This is another patient and there are a few of these that I have revised where, as Vivek described, the dog bone has flipped and that's because of the nature of the coracoid. It's not of how you place the graft. We will talk about the coracoid, which is a very strange bone and a very challenging bone structure. So the... Bindra et al. have uh, published this, that there's almost a 40% incidence of complication with implants uh, in AC joint reconstruction, either the coracoid fractures or the clavicle fractures, and that's because of repetitive cyclic loading. That's how the science works. The point I'm trying to make here is that the coracoid is a curved bone. It's not straight. It's not 90 degrees. That's how we imagine it looking at in the picture. Since I do a lot of arthralatages, I've come to understand the coracoid because in an arthralatage, we ought to drill the coracoid perpendicular and my drill comes very medially directed. It's very awkward to see. In an AC joint dislocation, if we start drilling the coracoid, we're going to hit and miss it or go eccentric 
and that's why one of the first premise in my procedure was not to drill the coracoid and that's very clever of amit joshi that he just loops the uh, sutures around the coracoid you just eliminate one big complication by looping around the coracoid because a coracoid fracture is very difficult to manage after this if you check them ensure that these patients are reducible the biggest complication now of this procedure has been that the uh, reduction gives way because if you are relying only on a structural synthetic uh, repair then it is going to give way due to cyclic loading whereas if you do a biological then it is probably going to hold a long way this is an interesting paper by marcus shaibul who's also got a huge body of work on ac joint and marcus is a person who was involved in designing the tight rope which later went into the dog button and then it came up to the double dog button and then it came up to the graft rope so you must understand that one company has migrated from its native implant tight rope for the ac joint gone into dog bone gone because he understands there are huge failures marcus in his personal commission when i met him in berlin told him that he has given up the implants and uh, does something very similar that we do but a different approach as an open approach so the they, this paper recommended that you must always over reduce the ac joint now this is uh, difficult and not always possible but the ones that were over reduced were remained anatomical those who were anatomical did slip back almost 20 25% so there are several options we'll skip all of this i'm going to uh, discuss my uh, ab procedure which is the biological reconstruction of the cc ligaments where we use a semi t graft and where i use an augment with a mercelin tape uh, the original procedure has remained the same that i did in 2002 the minor technical improvements we did was we used to use the gracilis which we thought was enough and one day in a young girl we found that her gracilis was absolutely poor 2 mm so we took her semi t and once a lion tastes blood then he doesn't go back to eating grass so we just switched to semi t our first uh, 10 procedures had the ac joint open up later on with a 3 mm bump so we decided we'll augment it because that Uh, two things: the semi T is very difficult to cinch and tie together, and till such time that the graft gets integrated uh, and ligamentizes, we need to protect the graft. And so, mercelin tape provides that support for the first six to eight weeks till the graft becomes uh, rock solid. The mercelin tape is a much flatter structure and distributes weight evenly, unlike some of the sutures or the fiber tapes. And that's why we've had zero fracture incidents on the clavicle or the coracoid. Uh, just four portals on the front the these are symmetrically placed in a clockwork fashion the number 3 portal is straight in line with the uh, coracoid this is the medial portal as long as you make it superficial very safe and this fifth portal goes a little superior and medial to the coracoid that's where we pass in the graft and for the clavicle what is important here for you to understand is that the metric that i mentioned was 35 mm that's why this line is drawn so we exactly measure from the ac joint before we make our portal so this is the incision that we make on a clavicle so that i know that my drill hole in the clavicle is at 35 mm so it's equipoised between the conoid and the trapezoid arthroscopically i have the advantage that i can see the footprint of the conoid trapezoid but if you're doing open this is how you would approach your incision and a straight saber shape incision works well as well Oh, sorry. Just trying to get rid of my mouse. Yeah. And uh, so I first pass the needle anterior to the clavicle, and my this is my scopy view, the number two portal, straight in line with the coracoid. This is a Wiesinger rod which elevates the deltoid to create space. and my radio frequency always comes from the medial portal and it's always parked in there in case you need because this is extra articular endoscopy and so bleeding can be uh, can is not unusual the needle tells me that yes my needle is passing exactly at 35 mm so that this uh, i can trace the footprint of the conoid trapezoid and confirm that my drill hole in the clavicle is between the conoid and trapezoid so for the open procedure uh, you expose in a saber incision 
And then sometimes if it's chronic and you've got chondrolysis, I would rarely do a lateral and clavicle osteolysis. The drill hole comes in there. This graft is looped around the coracoid. I'll tell you how. There's a neat technique there that I'm going to show you. But it's much easier to understand on the graphic rather than the uh, actual real pictures. So this is a Satinsky uh, forceps. It's a vascular uh, clamp that I borrowed from my CVTS colleagues. And you loop it around the clavicle and then pass one end anterior to the clavicle and the second end through the clavicle so that you've got two different vectors coming in. So that because there are two different vectors, we believe that our technique mimics the conoid and the trapezoid. And then you tie them over to themselves. If uh, you have a anterior posterior shift, then that excess graft in a semi is long enough to take it across to the acromion, drill a hole through the acromion, pass it over and tie it to yourself. And this is very well done elegantly, even open. Uh, there are subtle differences that we'll talk at the end of our talk here. Okay, so coming to the arthroscopic technique here, again, viewing portal is number three in line with the coracoid, mark the promontory and clear up the clavipectoral fascia. What you see here is the pec minor here. Uh, this is the right coracoid and we've got the CA ligament on this side. You clear up all those tissues there. And then what you're seeing is the undersurface of the coracoid clearing up. I retain the pec minor and the CA ligament to prevent the graft from slipping anteriorly. We just make a small window exactly as Amit Joshi showed in his talk so that we have enough area for passage of the graft. So this is the medial aspect of the coracoid that we are looking. We are looking straight in line front of the coracoid. And this is the part of the pec minor. And here, so looking at the medial side here, you can use your shaver, be careful. Uh, the superior half of the coracoid tends to bleed because that is the most vascular structure ne next to the uh, cephalic vein. And then here at the bottom, you see that Having prepared this, you see a pec minor coming in here, CA ligament here, and you've made a window. I will just fast forward it to save time so that we can cover the important bits. Now the suture shuttle, this probably is the most interesting. The, the Satinsky will always come from medial to lateral because you don't want to mess around medially. And then we pass a ethylon number one. You could use a PDS as well and loop it underneath the coracoid and then railroad the graft muscle together underneath the coracoid so that you can pass them through. So that's the graft with the muscle tape going underneath the coracoid. Yeah. Okay. And now you trace the clavicle, which is fairly posterior, and you ought to drill fairly medial as to what you think. If you're using the 35 millimeter mark, then you're going to be absolutely accurate you'll be in the footprint of the CC, uh, CC ligament on your left and right. Uh, then you widen the tunnel, keep the radio frequency at hand. You can use a curette as your drill comes through to protect the deeper tissues and clear up the tunnel. I just pass an artery forcep through that and widen and smoothen the area so that there are no sharp edges that can uh, compromise the graft as it slips through because there is likely to be friction in there. So that's a clavicle bit, that's a preparation. And here's the tricky bit here. Now the graft relay. So you can pass the graft with the muscle tape directly through the clavicle, or you can use an indirect suture shuttle here, like what we used to. It has already been passed underneath the coracoid. And then you take the thin end of the graft, pass the sutures only first so that the graft will go in easily. I invariably use a four or at maximum five mm ACL drill for the clavicle. As that goes through, then you know that you can seize them together. So this is the medial end, this is the lateral end. You must see that they are moving in very freely without any resistance because then you want to pull up them equidistant and tie them over. What you see on the right side, this on the top is the Satinsky forceps. And this is a special instrument we have designed 
or uh, the ab pusher so that that helps spread the length and one assistant is holding it on the lateral clavicle to reduce the clavicle so manually it's impossible to reduce the clavicle so we use this pusher which is a full curve pusher and then this is the final position you can see the graph uh, coming in this is the lateral side this is the medial side this is the thoracoid and you can see that the pec minor is preventing slippage slippage of the graph so it has to remain at the root or the elbow of the coracoid because that's the anatomical position that you want it to be now and it's fairly taut the mercellin tape is on the other side that's why you're not able to see it but you can see here this is the mercellin tape and this is the semi t graft it's a robust and then you can press the clavicle several times once you've tied it down and you can see there's hardly any movement there uh, that tells you that you've had achieved significant stability and that's your final graft cinch here so when you do the final graft cinch uh, once the muslin tape is easily cinchable that helps reduce and you can put three throws on the muslin tape and then you do the semi t which is not as cinchable but then you use sutures which will pass through the graft so that they will lock them in so here we have a ethibond number 5 on number 2 and you pass it through the graft and through the muslin tape and to the deltoid and trapezoid fascia there so that these sutures don't come undone that's a very important because it's a smooth graft it can slip out so this is the final graft change for you so sorry very rarely this is the only case that i've had to reduce where i always use intropsiam as vivek said we i think we agree more than we disagree that at the end of the procedure just before tying the muslin tape i will use a siam confirm that it's coming in line this was a patient who came in after 3 years and he was becoming a little proud so we reduced it with the ab pusher pass in the wire the most important thing i am trying to show you here is that the k wire has been well short of the tunnel that is very important you don't want your k wire to shoot through the tendon because the tendon is intrauterus through the clavicle don't want to damage that you can extend this technique to lateral and non union clavicles or sometimes even fresh clavicles with only a sliver of bone and we have reduced the clavicle back again for this gentleman bosworth screw i think we should only mention them in theory they are ridiculous and they can cause serious damage to the coracoid this guy just even in spite of the screw he was lying so high uh, luckily we use the same tunnel as the screw otherwise we would be challenged to make a tunnel right next to the screw and this was his final picture where you can see the muslin tape and the semi around the coracoid this is my only failure uh, significant failure that i've had i've had some issues where uh, there was one patient who had an infection he was a chemo, he was on chemotherapy for cancer he didn't tell us that and but the failure of reduction this was the only patient where i told you we put in a scope we saw a coracoid fracture and we were absolutely non plus we ended up going in putting in a 5 mm anchor in the root of the coracoid but it didn't work and that's our old tunnel that's gone off the roof and that was misery we waited for the coracoid to heal up and we waited 2 months we confirmed on 3d ct that the coracoid had actually healed up and we took her back in again and this time we used a peroneus longus tendon because we had run out of the semi t and reduced her back in again uh, she is now a 3 year follow up doing well and quite satisfactory this was her video at the end of one year and you can see that the shoulders are well maintained she has a good contour and stable with a full range of movement in there and you can see the same portal that we used twice we didn't have to make any new portals for her uh occasionally we've had the opportunity to do an mri and you can see on the mri you need to tell the radiologist to make fresh sequences in line with the cc ligament the conventional shoulder mri doesn't work and you can trace your ligaments very nicely here and this is the graph that has been integrated adequately so this is a uh, national cricket player whose ac joint reduction we done and he wanted his post op confirmation before he joined the team so you've got a nice reduction here but in addition to the nice reduction you can see that the graft had also been seen that is going exactly from the base of the coracoid right into its anatomical footprint so that was critical so we got this published in 2014 it's one of the better written papers that by us in literature consistently consistently everybody has mentioned 19 to 20% of complication rates most of them are the implants most of them are migration again 
and some are fractures and uh, coracoid and clavicle fractures so be careful that's a system across the world everywhere but resurgery rates according to hip and stall's paper 2018 ajsm very common with screw fixation very common with open reduction and suspensory fixation nice paper that was written there uh, this is another patient we've done recently and with that achieved an adequate reduction look at the drill hole that matches with the coracoid and it's exactly about 35 mm from the ac joint that's important i've stopped doing lateral and clavicle excisions we have had uh, reported uh, 20% collateral lesions in literature our infection rates are almost none except for that one patient um, and muslin tape is much flatter if flatter it helps us singe better but i always confirm on cm before i come out of theater the advantage of our technique is we don't use a pump we don't use an implant um, avoid deltoid insert that's the only difference between the open and arthroscopic technique open technique the anterior deltoid can get damaged because the windows for coracoid passage is much more medial the lateral and the ac joint exposure is much more lateral so often you have had anterior deltoid sleeve avulsions and those are difficult to treat as such but if you are careful and you make small windows between the deltoid then you don't damage that deltoid insert because that affects forward flexion and that causes wasting which doesn't appear well but always augment we've uh, stopped doing only biological we always augment uh, as if as something new over our original technique the best thing to do is avoid drilling coracoid you just eliminate one whole bunch of complications in the west they talk about two clavicle drill holes the western clavicles are much bigger broader and allow afford a two drill hole technique we always use semity and we pass them one anterior to clavicle one through the clavicle so we get a nice double vector as such the clavicle drill is actually much more medial than what you imagine it to be so if you take it too lateral then your uh, reduction is likely to uh, not hold the i have already talked about the biomechanics of ligament injury and the viscoelastic property that's why we are a big uh, big followers of the biological technique along with the augmentation but uh, to each his own now so irrespective of whether it's an acute or chronic i would use the same technique identical we don't discriminate between two previously we used to wait 3 to 6 weeks but if i know that this is type 4 type 5 then we'll go in early because it's better and you achieve a much better reduction the reduction is easier it gets very difficult once 3 to 6 months are over in conclusion implant failure rates can be high even in published literature avoid drilling coracoid use the augment whatever works uh, whatever floats your boat and uh, open versus arthroscopic probably is not such a big difference in terms of fixation the only one point i wanted to make was uh, the ladies are going to come in for cosmetic reasons the men will have medial scapular pain because of six scapula syndrome the vertical instability is what requires the procedure that vivek does amit does and i do and that is largely cosmetic and functional but if a patient has pain then always suspect an anterior displacement of the ac joint they are more painful than cosmetic so if you have damage to the superior or anterior ac joint then you want to extend this technique and get this graft across the uh, ac joint into the uh, chromium and wind it around so the symptomatic patients are the ones who have anterior displacement of ac joint the cosmetic and functional ones are the ones who have a superior and inferior displacement which by far are the most common of this lot sorry i try to finish less than half an hour i hope i have not delayed you too much thank you for your all your attention it was all it was all pleasure to watch your technique and listen to you sir and we have been listening to you watching you for you know for very long time i i'm sure that there will be a lot of question on this regard but i'll i'll try to incorporate in in interest of time also you know questions uh, during the um, discussion as well so i would request uh, bivek basukalla to you know uh, watch on the question that will be pouring in into the our chat box or from the youtube so let us clarify some very very basic doubts uh, with the expert so we'll be asking our questions that was submitted to me by my colleagues uh, so that it could be asked to you and has come from our experience as, as well uh, so i'll not go into uh, detail of this but very interesting paper which says that probably type 3 which is more debatable is more common 
uh, compared to type 1 and type 5. You know, type 3 is most common in, in all the types of injury. I'm not going to detail of that. So coming to the very important uh, interesting case uh, of uh, one of our patients, 32-year-old gentleman, he sustained a road traffic accident. Actually, he fell down from his motorbike and landed on tip of shoulder and he was seen in local hospital. And when he was, he came to us, he was loaded with all these braces. So this was, a, if you see that, this is a clavicular brace and then this is a shoulder immobilizer. So uh, the question to uh, Dr. Vivek Pandey. So what is your take on, how, do, you, do you immobilize uh, in clavicle brace and what is your suggestion on shoulder immobilizer or, um, you know, the sling? Uh, arm sling. Dr. Vivek, Vivek Pandey. Is Vivek not there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm sorry. It was mute. Um, so, Amit, uh, see, the question is if you're going to, uh, let's say, manage conservatively, then there is no point giving all this jing bang. Okay. You have to just give an arm sling for the pain relief for a few days and then gradually start mobilizing and then you know all the exercises later uh, come in if you are anyway going to operate then also this jing bang is not required and they have absolutely no biomechanical rationale to be given good old days yes figure of four is the only standard thing you know actually what ashish you know showed people do do that even today that is the only thing actually it can hold it to certain extent though it is not really recommended but it can still push the clavicle down because it not only that it pushes the clavicle down and takes the arm upwards but all these things are absolutely useless i i would never do this so i think that is what i just wanted to highlight that many of the cases that uh, you know come to our opd uh, in the sports opd they are loaded with all these uh, you know the clavicular brace and the shoulder immobilizer, even the arm pouch slings and all. So probably, sir. See, uh, I mean, the yes. clavicular brace is not fit even for the clavicle. There is a you know debate, ongoing debate that clavicle clavicular brace can be given all together if you are managing clavicle, just manage it. We manage with the help of an arm sling because it cannot reduce it. You know, it's it has to be extremely tight all the while, which cannot be done. So clavicular brace is. It's kind of, yeah, in clavicle fracture, we still do give, it's like, you know, Tata okay philosophy, keep on doing some things, but not in ACJ, certainly. Sorry. And then what, what important thing, if you see under the clavicular brace, there is a tape also that Asis sir was trying to say, you know, this, this was the tape was given to him. Yes. So, uh, Asis sir, what, what is your take on, you know, the clavicular brace, the shoulder immobilizers and the, uh, and this, uh, this kind of taping? So honestly, uh, absolutely useless, don't do anything. But if they put in a sling and brace, it's okay because I will forgive them. But this I would never forgive. They put this uh, sticky dinoplast, which has zinc oxide, and they are putting it exactly over AC joint. So the patient usually turns up to me after two weeks, three weeks. And that time there are blisters under the AC joint. And that's when I have to delay surgery for two to three weeks, just because there's a blister, because of stupid uh, sticky was put in, it doesn't do anything because it's a ligament disruption. So if this was going to cure it, I would use a sling, I would use a brace. It doesn't. We just put an arm sling pouch for comfort. In America, they use something called the Kenny Howard sling, which has a strap and things, but it has a zero function. It doesn't work. I think I, yes, sir. Uh, yes, thank you very much. This is, this is, uh, from our recent patient, you know, you, you got all these things uh, uh, with that patient and then patient had a dislocation. So this was a very old paper. It was in 1997, I think, where the taping technique has been described for the treatment of AC joint sprains for grade one and grade, grade two, not for the grade three. And these uh, strapping will not help. Uh, so what is your take on assessor clinical examination to decide either this is type three, four, or five, you know? Right. Uh, again, four and five are very obvious gross because there's almost a 200% to 400% shift. So uh, that's not such a challenge. The difference is type three, where it appears between 25 to 100. So if it's less than 100, then it's going to mix between a type two and type three. So that is a difficult metric to solve. Um, but that's again, an X-ray classification. I wouldn't do that clinically. 
what I would look for is uh, neuro deficit, scapular dyskinesia. Look at them from behind. If they have gross scapular dyskinesia, then wait for some time before you actually go and do the surgery because after surgery, if you immobilize, then the scapular dyskinesia can get affected. To the extent, uh, because of our technique, the repair being so robust, I don't immobilize any of my patients. Uh, I just tell them, no driving, be sensible, but they can start mobilizing themselves straight away. So, you, sir, uh, you mean to say that probably this is one joint or one injury in, in which clinical examination has less importance than yeah. the radiological examinations? Absolutely right. All I need to look for is reducibility, no wound there, and uh, uh, scapular. I spend more time looking at the scapula than the AC joint. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, I'll skip this. Uh, Janka view, uh, Vivek already showed. Uh, I'll not go into this one, but this is uh, recommended by some literature. Vivek, uh, the baseline uh, radiological investigation for AC joint injury. So, do you do all these things, all these x ray in all your patient, or uh, there is anything that either you just get away with the Janka view of both the AC joint alone? I, I mean, I just do the now uh, for the time being, uh, I just do the axillary view of the affected shoulder and I just do the AP both shoulder together to get the comparison. See, that is as Ashish said now, the comparison with the other side is extremely important, whether it is within 100% or more than 100%. Even the stress views, um, in fact, last few days back, we were discussing on our shoulder group also, doesn't really help much. It doesn't change my, you know, idea. Most of the time it is almost the same. And I would just add one point to the last slide. If there is an obvious deformity, then it is definitely three and above. If you don't see a deformity, then it is one and two. That is at least one thing in the clinical examination and always and always and always rule out brachial plexus, if especially if it is a fall from bike. See high velocity accidents, upper trunk brachial plexus injuries very, very frequently missed. It's not very common, but it is not though uncommon also. So rule out brachial plexus injury. And if you see a deformity is always three and above. Rest is always the x-rays and x-rays. I always do the AP on both the sides. So to get the comparison, that's all. All these things, I think more or more have become theoretical. But so Basumani so view has certainly got, you know, this what so, so called the scapular Y view has got some role. Uh, Babulkar, sir, what, what is your armamentarium of x-rays? So what are the x-rays do you send for, you know, these patients who comes to you with the AC joint injury? To be honest, Amit, I'm getting exhausted agreeing with Vivek. We've never agreed so much more. Uh, in fact, if you do any kind of AP view, it's still okay. You don't have to be. Uh, we do a Zenka view, for sure. We, we've not done a weighted view at all. We've, uh, you can do a comparison view. But my highest recommendation is please always do an axillary lateral. That is very important. Because in case there's an anterior shift, then you don't want to miss that patient because that again is a diagnosis that's done on X-ray. And if you see this post-op, we've seen a couple of failures of uh, the tightropes who came in later. Not only did they have a vertical failure, but the clavicle has shifted anteriorly. And that's a very difficult problem to solve because they are in great pain. So be careful of the axillary lateral. Uh, absolutely. I'll not go into detail of these uh, articles because we all have read. And then Babulkar sir and uh, Vivek Pandey clearly mentioned that, uh, you know, any of the X-ray, whatever view we do, probably they do not have that much of impact. And again, I'll skip uh, this slide in the interest of, you know, uh, time that weight bearing views, uh, uh, putting weight on both the shoulder and comparing bilateral is not very much popular nowadays, which used to be, you know, one of the commonest thing that we used to, when I was doing my residency, AC, each and every AC joint patient, they used to go for, you know, uh, weight bearing views and then only, um, you know, assessed for the AC joint. Uh, this is another paper. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that 87% of the, you know, uh, participants of this paper, which was published in 2018, they do not do weight bearing view and only 10% those who do weight bearing view, they rely or they change their uh, you know treatment plan based upon the weight bearing view. So probably uh, at this moment we do not have enough evidence to do a weight bearing view. Uh, next thing is um, uh, I think Rajiv put this question early. 
there are two things uh, mri in ac joint injuries are actually done for two things one to identify what are the associated injuries and the second thing is to for the ac joint itself so uh, we have already talked about um, uh, mri for you know associated injury babulkar sir what is your take on uh, doing mri for ac uh, injury be proper for the diagnostic so, purpose or for the uh, treatment planning seriously speaking um, i don't need these investigations and we never used to do them till that complication happened when there was a coracoid fracture after that we had two more patients who had coracoid fractures we are doing imaging just to ensure that there is no coracoid element here a rare event it's not so common so i am happy to operate a patient who has an x ray confirmed ac joint dislocation not mandatory as vivek says uh, here i go agreeing with him very rare associated injuries if you are doing a diagnoscopy you can skip the mri it's not giving us any additional information okay vivek you want to add something uh, on this one because uh, people nowadays are talking more and more about mri in ac joint injury itself no i mean i would not do i mean if the patient can elevate he's a reasonably young man he can elevate i mean they will always be able to elevate you know and uh, there's no neurovascular then i i would not do there's no point because over the years so many we have done and we have not found so significant in associated injury then there's no point statistical reason to do that and actually in where irrespective of which procedure we are doing with amit doing his uh, fiber wires and fiber tapes uh, vivek doing his uh, several techniques uh, and uh, somebody doing bosso screw i doing my loop uh, tendons all our surgeries are predicated on the coracoid so that's why we need to invest in in the coracoid just to check that the coracoid is not damaged otherwise you are okay and we've had one coracoid two coracoid fractures in about 90 patients so not a very common scenario absolutely so i think uh, we have answered rajiv questions or that probably mri is not you know uh, commonly done process uh, investigation at except there are some sinister condition if you diagnose if you clinically you see that there is a possibility of the rotator cuff tear or the coracoid fracture as well let's go briefly into these uh, techniques which are still popular in our country you know so this is from one of our uh, our uh, colleague Uh, what is your opinion on tension band wiring for ac joint uh, vivek because i absolutely know that babul kasar will say that this is absolutely no for his cases so vivek uh, what is your take on this you said k wire is big no but uh, tension band wiring i don't know i mean i you know i prefer to speak only if i have my personal evidence so i have seen some of my colleagues doing and uh, they say good result but we don't know because no one follows if you actually remove all this jing bang and you follow them at let's say you know by 6 to 8 weeks you know or 3 3 to 4 months a lot of them they dislocate but they don't see their patient they don't follow because they are not primarily shoulder surgeon remember 90% of the shoulder surgeons or the sports surgeons do not do this they are usually orthopedic surgeons who do that but an orthopedic surgeon usually they don't have much interest so they don't follow they don't see see remember again patient may have minor subluxation he may not remain symptomatic okay but whether this procedure has been able to reduce the joint accurately and keeps that way for you know forever that is the question so i i don't do it i mean i don't do and i don't subscribe to this and here also if you see it's out of the acromion also absolutely yes uh, i have collected about 12 of these uh, you know yes sir yes sir go ahead sorry k wires do migrate i personally have removed yes, a k wire for yes sir you are trying to say something yes yes sorry am i audible i am yes sir am... you are audible sir yes sorry yes sir so, yes sir actually k wire agnostic uh, on all proximal humerus fractures and ac joints but i have removed a migrated k wire because they do migrate from underneath the trapezius near the spine the cervical spine and my late boss uh, late simon frostick has uh, showed me x ray of a k wire migrated into the subclavian vein so be careful k wires are not going to solve this issue and best not to advocate i'd rather not treat the patient and he will still be better off 
Absolutely. So uh, uh, I have collected about 12 of these cases uh, done by some of our colleagues. And to tell you very frankly, uh, most of these patients, you know, they have osteoarthritis of the AC joint and then they come with pain. Even if they do not have superior migration or the subluxation of the AC joint, they surely will have a osteoarthritis of the AC joint and they require some secondary surgery for that. So that is 12 cases that I have collected from uh, some of my colleagues. Uh, okay, so Bosworth um, is still, you know, uh, popular in, uh, still available, uh, people are doing Bosworth uh, technique in our context. And I think I'll not go into this one because uh, Vivek and Babulkar sir, both of them, they said that probably this should be out of context, only the theoretical purpose. So uh, I'll ask uh, Babulkar sir, what is your take on hook plate? Why do you don't want to, you know, advocate hook plate, at least in acute cases? Sure. Um... We've done these hook plates when I was training in Liverpool in the past, but this is one procedure I would never ever do. The hook plate was designed for lateral end clavicle fractures where there's very little purchase on the lateral end and it's an ideal indication for a lateral end clavicle. The biggest drawback of a hook plate is you have automatically inflicted a second surgery on this patient, number one. And I have a better option where uh, we can do several other procedures without having to do a hook plate as such. So my classic, and I've done hook plates for lateral and clavicle fractures where you have just a small flake of bone, non-unions, absolutely ideal indication. And I completely agree with Vivek. Uh, we started using hook plates in 1994-95 in Liverpool. And uh, the plates, actually, the hook goes far behind in the posterior acromion. So I'm not too worried about the impingement part. But I think it's a cannon to kill a rat to put such a big implant there where I'm here advocating an implantless technique. So it's difficult for me to convert, you know, it's like changing my religion. Uh, Vivek, uh, can I ask you why, why you still continue using the plate? No, because Amit, I... You know, I, I, I would always speak with my results and I have never got any problem with this implant um, because initially I started using it, you know, uh, one or two cases I saw somebody using, then I used it. And those days I was not doing arthroscopic, you know, this uh, and I, the dog button was not there. The tight row was already failing and I was not very sure about this reconstruction. So I said, OK, what do we have? So somebody said, OK, hook plate, I thought, okay, hook plate. Then in one of the conferences about six, seven years back. I was heavily criticized that why are you using hook plate, you know, by one of the British faculty. And uh, I said, I have no problem. He said, oh, if you have no problem, why don't you come up with your results? So I said, okay, I'll come back after some, several years. So this year we compiled all of our results of hook plate for five years, hook plate versus dog button. And we realized that it's a good implant. Um, I, you see, it does work as Asi said in fantastically in the lateral end because in lateral end, I am very, very scared of putting those plates, flimsy plates. And often what happens after fifth day, it comes out. You know, the purchase is very poor. And it does work. Yes, that is the only problem as Asi said. The, the minute you put this, you have already committed for the second implant. But it's okay. Once in a while, I do use. It's not that my it's my first implant, but I do use once in a while. So maybe now the frequency is something like once in six months. And they come back after six months, they say, okay, now you remove. The reason is a bit cheap because I have still not subscribed to that. I want to do reconstruction in a very early stage. And I do get an opportunity to repair the deltoid to trapezial fascia. That's all. So here is the only place where me and Ashish differ. It's good to have some differences. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you, Vivek. I think tightrope is out of question now because it yeah, is yeah, yeah. That's completely out. Uh, replaced by the dog buttons, uh, uh, single and double dog buttons. We were done. Uh, Asis, sir, uh, what is your take on we were done? I remember you, you used to propagate this technique earlier. Well, uh, now it's the modified we were done, what you've shown with a flake of the acromion, so that that has a better healing chance. But it doesn't have the excursion, number one, of the pliability of a long tendon. Number two, it is 20% of the strength for CC ligament. I have articles that I can share with you. And number three, if you look at your picture, it is attached non-anatomically to the tip of the coracoid. When we do an ACL, we are going to replicate 
original normal anatomy same thing here that our graph whatever we put should loop in at the elbow of the coracoid only then will it serve to stabilize the ac joint so not a good idea failure rates are too high this was our go to procedure at liverpool we used to done dozens of these for rugby players and within a few months they used to come back with the clavicle popped up and everything had given way very common so our failure rates in our institute at the royal liverpool hospital were almost 50% okay thank you sir um, i think um, this is what uh, we all were talking about the you know uh, biological reconstructions which is modification of the mazuka's technique uh, that babul karsar also agrees that this has uh, gone a lot of uh, modifications and babul karsar's technique is quite useful in the sense that he makes only one tunnel uh, and then we also have done a you know analysis of the width of the clavicle and the nepalese clavicle are not that great as well so probably only one tunnel or even a no tunnel in the clavicle technique will would be a better idea in our case uh so uh, open versus arthroscopic assisted technique so uh, babulkar sir what you suggest so those arthroscopy surgeon who are doing open technique they should try to do arthroscopic assisted or they should continue uh with the open technique itself am i audible hello yeah amit you are audible i think we have lost ashish Yeah, he is back. Uh, Vivek, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think Ashish is back. Yeah, yeah. I'm back. Uh, am I audible? So uh, that was I. Hello. so the question was sir whether to continue with the open technique no no that that i heard i think in between we are losing ashish and amit yeah yes, if you ask me i think uh, it's good to you know to gradually shift to arthroscopy because you see the clavicle side is not a problem but if you look at the you know the the uh, coracoid you know the looping around coracoid becomes very easy without as ashish was telling now without damaging the deltoid mm -hmm. so i think it's in the due course of time as one is progressing gradually it is better you know because otherwise your incisions are long you have to literally detach sometimes you have to detach the part of deltoid to see it around and to loop around coracoid is not easy so if somebody is interested he can always you know always progress so because once you start repairing the subscap arthroscopically okay and then i don't think it's a big deal because you are around the coracoid so many times so uh... my next question uh, is to absolutely thank you vivek yes, uh, my my yes vivek you can you can continue because my internet was unstable so i was not able to complete but that was my last slide okay. and the last question so should should a surgeon try to shift to arthroscopy assisted rather than uh, all open technique that was my last slide and um, so, so we have a question I, sir yes please continue with the question sir vivek sir you saw in your technique <clears throat> uh, where you scoped from posterior go through the uh, rotator interval and reach the uh, the coracoid and assist sir showed all extra articular procedure so which one is the good one uh, <clears throat> is it good to bilate or uh, it up every all the uh, structures within the uh, rotator interval just to get around the uh, coracoid or do all extra articular like assist sir does Oh, Vivek. It depends upon which technique are you talking. Okay, so let's say we are doing the suspensory. Suspensory, you can always go only all arthroscopic. You need not to go all because you are not looping anything around the coracoid. So you just drilling a tunnel. Okay, then it is fine. But if you are doing this uh, grafting, you know, then you have to go, you know, extra articular. Are there any harm of uh, getting all all the structures of the rotor interval down as we do from uh, the intra articular? 
there is nothing you know you always clear the rotator and table frozen shoulder sub scap repair so there is nothing there okay okay assist sir what what is the advantage of your technique over intra articular assisted technique well um, to each is own whatever you are comfortable with um, so you can use either techniques as long as you can get an anatomical fixation that's the critical thing so i am comfortable going extra articular because of my experience with arthrolatages so i believe that we are as close to anatomy as possible i am sure the same technique can be done through the glenohumeral joint through the rotator interval i don't see a big challenge there at all only thing is then the clavicle tunnel is blind here we measure 35 mm so that's the only different thing between and if you're not so comfortable with arthroscopy feel free to do it uh, open i just checked my series today before doing starting this talk and i realized we had done 42 open cases of ac joint from 2002 to 2012 and since then we have done 44 arthroscopy so technically our experience is half and half i am not saying that my arthroscopy experience is 80% so we are exactly half and half over open and arthroscopy okay thank you sir so over to you amit sir i think um, uh, uh, i should hand over the mic to the president of arthroscopy society of nepal to give a closing remark and then uh, since we have overshooted our time and then from my personal behalf and from my participants i'd like to thank vivek pandey and ashish babulkar sir for being with us for a, such a long time and you will be amazed that we have still live 50 people you know listening to you and watching our live telecast Uh, 50 people are still on the telegram live uh, isur sir now your turn to give a closing remarks and we'll say a goodbye till we make, meet next time uh thank you amit we had a, a very nice two hour more than two hour discussion on the acromioclavicular uh, joint injuries uh, uh from uh, from uh, from ason i would like to very well you know thank deeply uh, our two eminent speakers from uh, india dr ashish babulkar and vivek dr vivek pandey uh, it was an excellent you know discussion we learned a lot and and thank you for giving us the time you know to uh, teach us and help us with our further improvement in shoulder um, injuries yeah i would just like to say that ac joint is so common then still a uh, lot of people have their own way of doing it and there has been so much of development in the research and the way people treat and still is is, is an enigma but uh, after a uh, uh, hearing to all of you you know to 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 all this uh, through this uh, meeting i think we have been enlightened a lot thank you very much uh, dr bibek and dr asis uh thank you all the in house in country speakers also and my uh, heartiest uh, thank to amit and uh, vivek and also the scientific chairman scientific committee chairman dr sailas uh, and all the other speakers also you know uh, to bringing out this uh, very nice academic excellent uh, meeting so with that thank you and uh, from my side from ason good night to our uh, friends from india and to all to all in the country thank you thank you sir good thank night. you thank you good night good night stay safe take care take care thank you very much vivek thank you very much ashish sir we'll we'll thank see you. you very soon see you soon uh, thank you amit thank you somewhere in shoulder conclave and somewhere in yes. ason meeting in nepal yes. as well sir indeed thank you ashish boss good night thank you vivek take care bye, bye. bye. Bye.